Okay. Um, I guess we can uh, get started. So my name is Tom Herbert. Um, first of all, I want to make a special shout out to Jamel for organizing the conference. Also, uh, the program committee, I was actually uh, the so-called shepherd for it, which means I got to watch them do their work and actually didn't uh, do anything. Uh, Rupa was the chair. Um, and then we had, I think, uh, eight others who did a lot of work to actually look at each presentation, um, its technical merit. Um, we had some interactions with the authors, make sure that it was uh, really good for the conference. So I'd like to thank the program committee uh, publicly also. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about achieving super low latency. Um, I don't think this is quite as much a workshop. I guess the, the, the point of this is more or less to raise the problem, um, try to get people thinking about it. There's a lot of pieces to the end goal, and it is quite ambitious what we're trying to do. So super low latency obviously has a lot of meanings. Um, so for instance, we hear a lot about, let's say, RDMA latency, which is in the microseconds. Um, but today we're really talking about super low latency on the internet. So this is what user perceived latency would be. And the reason we need this is emerging real time applications. So you imagine uh, self-driving cars, uh, we have a little bit of a demo of that in a bit. Um, but other use cases, uh, some people want to do mobile surgery, uh, various cases where uh, super low latency is critical. And when we talk about super low latency, Invariably, it really is about uh, tail latency, variance, jitter. All of those are very important. So if we say we have a five millisecond uh, latency because we want to serve um, AR, that really means the variance has to, has to be within five milliseconds. So your 99.99% latency or what have you fits within that, that profile. And the other part about this uh, sometimes people tend to forget it's not just the data path. The control path often becomes part of the latency. And as we know, like a TCP setup time or security setup, security association setup time, these things can often be orders of magnitude greater than what we consider just a strict data path latency. In a real world application, mobile um, device driving down the street in a car, for instance, passing from one cell to another, there's this thing called handover and there's a lot of change to that how fast it can recover and get, the, get back on path uh, for the application is critical after it, say, passes from one cell to another. So we're going to be looking at, at kind of both of those. This is um, some numbers I pulled off the web. Uh, I found a nice paper that was specifically about uh, AR, augmented reality, and the kind of latencies uh, there. So I augmented that uh, with few extra numbers. So at the 500 millisecond to one and a half second range. This is actually typically considered the human latency in an automobile accident, uh, 500 milliseconds. So if they do the, the studies, they found that people are so distracted that um, they just assume that you had 500 milliseconds, half a second to make a decision. So that's kind of what, um, I don't know if NTSB defined that, but that's what used in, used in, it's used in a lot of investigations. So when we go down from that, about a quarter of a second, that's the average uh, human reaction time for visual stimuli, so they have a, a test of this. Uh, when you get down to about 200 milliseconds, this is when um, speech starts to be noticeable. Uh, also, uh, Lewis Hamilton, a Formula One driver, apparently they measured his, his reflexes trying to get the baseline for what a race car driver can do. He was about 200 milliseconds. Uh, but once we go below that, we start to get into uh, kind of the subconscious types of uh, latencies that become interesting. So at about 20 milliseconds, uh, that's where you can actually start to detect differences in, say, AR and in, in visual input. Um, 10 milliseconds, haptic de delay, that's kind of the touch. So if you have a, a Wii controller that shakes, uh, 10 millisecond latency for perception. Uh, but one of the more interesting ones, all the way down to 5 milliseconds, this is uh, the delay for so-called cyber sickness. So if uh, we're wearing, I guess, like an Oculus uh, device and there's a, a jitter of five milliseconds in that, wear it long enough, play it long enough, eventually get a headache. Um, so five milliseconds starts to really push uh, real world latency down. And less than five milliseconds, we start to talk about 
uh, possible machine-to-machine -machine kind of um, interactions. So what kind of applications are there? So we've mentioned augmented reality, VR, uh, gaming is going to be very interested in this. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, applications in the IoT space. I would consider self-driving cars, uh, traffic systems, some of those. Uh, clearly factory floor and robotics also fall into that category. They tend to have some interesting and kind of common characteristics. So one of those is multidimensional input. Um, this kind of dovetails into the applying machine learning and AI uh, for very complex, sophisticated systems that require low latency. So it's kind of uh, almost conflicting goals. You're trying to do incredibly com uh, com complex things like a human brain does, but very quick, quicker than a person. So we get into computer vision, AI, machine learning. And at some point, these do become life or death kind of, of decisions. We've already seen this with the self-driving cars. Um, they make a mistake. Yeah, somebody's life's at, at risk. So this uh, maintaining that latency guarantee actually becomes quite critical in certain environments. So one of the more interesting um, and kind of representative things to look at, we can look at a, a traffic intersection. So you can imagine your common urban traffic intersection. There's lights. Uh, there may be cameras. There's pedestrians. There's cars. Some of them self-driving. Uh, most people have a smartphone. So the question is, how, how do we modernize this in order to get the most efficiency through this intersection, but also make it safe? So this is, in some sense, it's futuristic. The, the ultimate goal is, we could, like, eliminate traffic lights. Everything is just automated and people can uh, whiz through the intersection. So it turns out that um, people have already thought about this. So there's uh, some nice computer simulations. You can look these up. Uh, this particular one, actually, I'd seen at an IETF in a 5G conference. And it's really, really cool. So the idea is cars uh, just communicate with one another or the infrastructure. They get their token. They pass through the intersection unimpeded. So very much like a networking problem, right? So these could be packets trying to, trying to avoid collisions. Uh, problem is packet loss is really bad here. Um, we can't lose cars, and, and corruption is also really bad. So uh, the, the tolerances for error are very, very slight. Um, automation actually reduces the tolerance for error because of uh, the numbers that we uh, projected before. But as we'll get into, uh, automation also has the downside. When it doesn't work, it can fail rather spectacularly. So that was kind of um, some motivation uh, for me to look at this problem. Um, and it's one thing to do a computer simulation. That, that's fine and all. But in the real world, things are different. Uh, so I brought, brought a little bit of the real, real world with me today. Um, this is kind of a prototype that I've been working on on and off. Uh, sometimes I call it a real job. Sometimes I call it for fun. Uh, in any case, it's nice to think, think it's serious work. Um, but this is a, a little slot car simulation. I'll try to bring it up. Um, there's a lot that can go wrong. This is a live demo. So uh, if it doesn't work, I, I'll try to bring it up um, at the, the bits and bytes. And also there's some fun modes where you can race the computer and things like that so people can actually do a little bit of hands-on uh, for that. But let me um, actually try to, try to run this, and I think you get an idea of uh, some of the problems that we face in the real world. shrink that. So is it possible to display the screen as is? Because if I switch it, it goes to higher or lower resolution. OK. So resolution is a bit of a problem. Um, but I think I can deal with it. 
so the idea of the, the slot car simulation um, emulates an intersection. So we have a, a traffic intersection, four cameras lighted on uh, poles. You, you probably see these are pretty common now. Uh, but the idea of these cameras is they're going to sense the vehicles. And if they detect the possibility of a collision, like two cars are coming in, uh, one is going to yield and allow the other one through. So it becomes, um, in theory, uh, it should emulate the computer simulation. So in order to do this, uh, it's kind of a two-step process. So that a lot of this is based on machine learning. So first thing I do, uh, crank up a car, and there is a, a learning step. Hold on. So um, let me let me do the controls, and then I'll I'll show the output. So what I'm doing right now, I'm teaching um, the system where the, what the lanes are. So we don't have to pre-program the lanes. It kind of can adapt to the camera position um, and other environmental factors. So that's the first lane. And then I'll do the same thing for the second. Okay, so now that maps out the lanes, and I can show the output of that. So um, pink lane is one, green lane is another. Looks like we're missing part of the lane there, so that'll be interesting. So the algorithm uh, this does is actually really trivial. It's basically a mutex. So um, the entry points are uh, cars come in this way, cars come in this way. Um, the potential of collision is there's cars in both of the critical regions. So the simple mutex says if somebody's already there, yield the other car. Okay, so now we'll actually try it. Uh, like I said, uh, a lot of variability here. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to go slower speed since we didn't quite get clear lanes. There we go. Okay, so if we can get the output, we can take a look what's happening here. Somebody moved. Uh, by the way, it's not a, uh, it's not adaptable to 50 foot giants. Uh. Tom, there's another way to, we can show this. Oh, there is. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, ah, now I lost it on the window. Uh, yeah, Okay, oh good, we have the camera going.
like a little window. Okay, so anyway, that's it. If we can expand that, we'd have it. A lot of pe virtual people die in this, by the way. Uh, anyway, so, um, yeah, like I said, uh, if you want a closer uh, look at this, um, I'll try to run it at bits and bytes tomorrow. But it was uh, kind of a cool little thing. Um, 30 frames per second. So we're already up to, what, 33 milliseconds. Um, and then uh, the interesting thing is that this is being run on the laptop. Uh, actually, let me let me go to the uh, details on the demo. Let's kind of uh, answer some of the questions, I think. Excuse me? Uh, that's just the camera. So, yeah, 30 frames per second. So then the processing um, entails OpenCV. Uh, so I wrote the program for that. If anyone's ever done OpenCV, OpenCV should have a good idea of uh, what that does. Okay. Oh, so good. So let me, uh, this is actually a recording. I, I can try to run this to get a better idea of what it's doing. So here you can see the blue car stops, blue car stops. Uh, they're taking turns. And then the silver car slowed down, so the blue car wins. So it, it really has no bias towards speed. It's just running the kind of, like I said, the mutual exclusion algorithm. So whoever enters the intersection first kind of wins. There is a mode where um, we can do manual control on one side and computer control on another. So that's kind of race the computer. Um, it's better, but uh, the computer can't keep up um, can't trust uh, the other individual, so uh, margin of error goes up, obviously. And then when it's two people doing it, um, it's kind of crazy. I took this rig into uh, my, my daughter's seventh grade class and let them play with it. And they could do no better than me. They were just crashing the cars left and right. So it's definitely prove, proof that some things co computers can do better. Okay, so um, this is just a quick overview of the, the simulation. So OpenCV, we're doing background su uh, substitution to identify motion. Motion identifies the, the vehicles. A uh, little Arduino controller talking to uh, H-Bridge to uh, drive 12, um, 12 volts on the track. Uh, this is a really dumb track, by the way. So like modern slot car tracks have radio control and things like that. So I haven't, haven't updated to that yet, which would be kind of cool. Um, but it does get, it gives the idea, and so it's a pretty good simulation of an intersection. Obviously, the real world would be about 100,000 times more complicated to do safely, but it's still the same principles. Um, so what, the, what the, can we learn from this? First of all, real world's a messy place. Um, there's error. When you send a command to something, it may or may not respond on it quickly. There's always variances. Uh, and that's not even latent or networking. So technically, there's no networking in here yet. This is all just the, the computer running the simulation. But between the, the cameras, uh, the controller, and the vehicle, there would be networking involved in there in real life. Uh, and that would be where the millisecond latency comes from. And again, it's not just networking that we're doing, right? It's also applications which need their own processing time. And complex applications like this, even with modern GPUs, still are going to have uh, a, lot of, a lot of heavyweight processing to do. Um, data doesn't like to be handled. I, 
I'm doubtful even at, at this frame rate that you'd want to send this data, say, over 5G to be processed at some back end in order to detect collisions. It seems like the data really has to be processed very close to the source. Um, Downsampling, I think this is, this is critical. So even in this case, we're getting 30 frames per second of HD. Try to have this little laptop process that even for four cameras. It can't keep up. Easiest solution, just shrink the picture, uh, compress it in a sense. So this is going to be very, very common in these sort of applications. Uh, even with the, the greatest projections of, of 5G, I don't think they can keep up with uh, devices trying to process this sort of data in the real world. Um, an interesting networking problem, or at least what I consider a networking problem, matching who you're talking to with who you're looking at. So in some sense, we may have a network connection to something, but now it's also interested what we're sensing from that. So very different than, say, in the data center where we really don't care about the location of the server we're talking to. It's just an uh, address in a, in a network. Here, though, if I you know, see an accident about to happen and I want to alert, say, a vehicle, I have to know not only that I'm communicating with that vehicle, but that you know, I have secure communication. So there are going to be a lot of uh, security issues and things like that, but also just fundamentally, how do I know exactly who I'm talking to? So even if they say my GPS location is X, Y, Z, do I trust them? That at some level, I want to actually see it. Uh, and then, like I said, when everything works, computers way better than humans for something like this. Um, in the presence of unexpected things, we have major accidents happening. Uh, like I said, uh, many, many virtual lives have been given for this uh, demo. So how do we get there? So we want to, we want to get to the super low latency in the real world uh, because of all these really cool applications. Uh, hopefully someday steering wheels go away and, and the world is a smart city, smart everything. Um, it's a hard problem. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it's a little bit different moving forward. It does require a lot of the stuff that's uh, being discussed here, um, but also some, some new methodologies, uh, particularly in networking and applications, working with, say, Linux uh, to get the right effects. So there are a lot of efforts underway. So XDP, BPF uh, kind of been talked about a little bit. Uh, IETF, they're also looking at the problem, uh, usually from a more protocol perspective. And for mobile, uh, I know at least 3GPP is interested in that. There's also um, some consortiums to do uh, roadside units for automotive. Um, so a lot of people are kind of looking at this, uh, but it is still an uh, ongoing um, problem to solve. Uh, there's always trade-offs. So in some sense, do you want to make the control plane more complex to simplify the data plane or vice versa? Um, we always want to find solutions that are most general, even though this they're becoming kind of narrow focus, so we still want to keep them general. And then there is a significant cross-coordination that's going to be required uh, to have any chance of solving this. So I would divide it up, the whole problem, into kind of four areas. So network architecture, protocols, implementation, and ecosystem. So each of these have uh, some interesting characteristics. So network architecture, there is a fundamental limit here that we can't overcome, the speed of light. So if I want to have, say, one millisecond latency, which is being touted by 5G as re request response time, just the speed of light puts me 90 miles away from, from the source. I guess you can convert that to kilometers since we're in Canada. Um, so we have a speed limit. Can't overcome that without you know, introducing tachyons, which I think is still a futuristic technology also. So we have uh, 93 miles. So physically, server or client have to be close. You cannot go back to the data center halfway around the world for each query. So a lot of this stuff is being pushed into the network. This is where you get so-called edge computing from. Uh, but the servers have to get really close to, to the source. So we see them popping up in uh, central offices, base stations, RSUs, roadside units, little devices at intersections. Also, some people even contemplate putting uh, servers at uh, cell phone towers. So. Um, in addition to physical latency, we have to minimize the number of hops. And there's two reasons to do that. One is more hops means more latency. So each hop actually has its own processing. Packets get queued, uh, congestion, what have you. So there's more latency there. Uh, but also, it's just a fundamental fact. The more hops you have, that reduces reliability. And obviously, in these applications, reliability uh, is like super critical, too. So it doesn't, 
isn't just fast, it also has to be super reliable. So we need a lot of work in uh, routers to do control queuing. Um, since there are not a lot of hops and theoretically not a lot of queuing, really not a lot of opportunity to do fast, fast, um, fancy traffic engineering. So we just need to be quick and precise uh, for this type of traffic. So the network does have to be architected to provide that. So protocols, uh, kind of another interesting one. People will say, well, can you use TCP for these applications? Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, TCP latency, um, but there's going to be some sort of application protocols that, that are designed for this. But beyond the application protocol, we can also consider uh, what's the underlying protocol. So obviously we want it to be IP, but in this world, there's, a, there's this also this mobile component. So devices are going around, we want to um, converge, say, to uh, a handover as quickly as possible. So we need to consider that. Uh, zero RTT solutions, TCP fast open, TLS, um, security, zero RTT security. Uh, those are obviously critical. So RTTs would be a killer in this environment. Uh, in addition to data plane, control plane is going to have a lot to do with this. Uh, one thing I should mention, if you consider the scope and the scalability of this, these applications, these networks, it's pretty much eventually becomes the whole world. Uh, if you're considering that every mobile device um, may at one point have a, a latency requirement like we're talking about, we're, there's a lot of scalability there. Um, so mobility becomes kind of hand in, goes hand in hand with a lot of this. And the other thing um, that we ha constantly have to consider, like I mentioned before, security and docibilities. So how do you prevent denial of service attacks? Denial of service attack on this, really bad. So somebody, you know, these, um, these are here, by the way, in order to prevent uh, overshoot where the cameras actually detect movement. So that would be an interesting denial of service attack. And I've actually heard uh, some people have um, tried to do, a, I guess, a denial of service attack or a security attack on stop signs. So autonomous vehicles read stop signs. Um, if you cover the stop, stop sign in a certain way, can you fool the, uh, the detection of thinking there's not a stop sign? Security is huge. This, these are real world problems. Uh, implementation, so probably a little closer um, to some of the immediate discussion we're having. Uh, there's something called attack of the killer microseconds. Uh, this is the, the idea that there's this um, kind of black hole in terms of latency in the networking stack. So if we go to the very lowest parts of the stack where it's a border of nanoseconds, and we've done a really good job uh, of doing that. Um, some of the, the RDMA uh, types of very hardware specific things get down into that. Uh, memory accesses are really good. At the other end, for kind of the gross latency, like um, doing a web search or something like that, um, that's really good too. Uh, but that sort of latency only has to get down in the 200 millisecond range before um, people notice it. So between those is attack of the killer microseconds where um, a few microsecond here, microsecond there can affect latency. It's one thing to consider. So that's why uh, a lot of the optimizations that are done in the stack um, are beneficial. However, there's a caveat to that, and this is one thing I, I've learned. Um, if you go through and you say um, do uh, uh, cache preloads everywhere, and you're on a benchmark, you'll see, oh, 10% performance gain. Run that against a real application load in production. Are you going to see a 10% performance gain? It won't be even close. You might be. You might see something. You might see. Might be half a percent um, if you're lucky. But that's better than nothing. And, and some of the thresholds really um, do warrant that. But it turns out the better optimizations, in some sense, are just to eliminate all parts of the system if you can. And that's uh, kind of goes back to the idea of minimizing the networking hops. So fewer hops is better. Sure, you can do uh, network function virtualization and go through 20 hops and do um, firewall on one system, security on another, and load balancing on another. That's great, but don't expect uh, that, to be, that to be good latency. So consolidation, squashing the stack, um, kind of contrary to, to what we learned over the past uh, 40 years about modularity and, and stack, but we know that once you have modularity, then the, the path to efficiency is to somehow squash the whole thing not eliminate the modularity, but make it appear it's still modular, but actually isn't. Um, 
Then there's uh, the, un I don't know if it's unfortunate, but there's the perceived host de uh, deployment issues. Uh, this kind of is something that obviously plagues um, Linux in particular. Uh, it's too hard to change the OS, so we hear that a lot. Uh, so Android came along with Quick, which actually is a good thing, but part of the reason was uh, they, they were, I guess tired isn't the word, but a little frustrated with trying to get TCP changes in. So it's a good protocol, but we actually see more extremes of this. Uh, DPDK, for instance, the whole socket layer needs to go away. Um, I think these are good. In a sense, they challenge us. But on the other hand, uh, I'm still finding it hard to believe that we can swap out the whole world that easily. So I think that's uh, something for this group to consider, how to make sure that um, Sockets interface actually scales and, and can go into the future where we do need that super low latencies. So zero copy and some of the other um, extensions that we made to socket interface are really good. Um, one of the other issues, and this is kind of kind of wraps everything together, if you really want to achieve this, this super low application visible latency, we have to consider the whole ecosystem. That's the application, the network, the OS, the path, um, all of it. All of these have to work. And this is something that I think to date we haven't really been very good at as a, as a whole industry. How do you get these guys to actually work together to achieve these common goals? So to a large extent, they've been siloed uh, for various reasons. Even, even at um, like companies like Google and Facebook, uh, guys that run large data centers, it's often the case that the people making the, the OS networking stack, uh, the people deploying it, the people who are building the hardware infrastructure, three very disjoint groups. And they often have um, interesting, the conflicting goals, right? So we know that uh, there's a lot of network devices out there that want to provide your firewall for you, um, but those could also do that. My question is, can they actually work together, um, take the best of both worlds in a sense and combine them? So when we do something like that, maintain good abstractions. Uh, fortunately, proprietary solutions seems to be dwindling. Uh, Software-defined everything seems to be helping. Open source seems to be prevailing uh, as a general general model. But it's still something to watch out for, make sure that uh, no one takes us down a proprietary solutions path uh, for various reasons. Um, applications interact with the network to get services. This, I think, is, is a, a big green field. Um, applications know whether or not they have critical latency requirements. They should be able to tell the network, by the way, this is critically low latency. Yeah, you can kind of do this with differentiated services, type OS or type of service, but that really doesn't have the, the granularity um, that the networks uh, would want. They can offer a huge range of services, and the application may need that. How do we get the application to actually express that to the network um, in an abstract fashion uh, that allows that kind of rich expression? Uh, so that gets us into the uh, the reverse thing, network and signal to the application. So we've already seen ECN, uh, a great technology, but what if this becomes more complicated? Um, what if we, the network can say, you know, for a certain path there's a better route? So there is some, um, some work done, being done on this. Uh, it usually starts with the higher layer because it is networking, uh, talking to hosts, but eventually OS will be involved. Um, I actually have a, a, a proposal on this and IETF to use IPv6 extension headers in order to communicate to the network uh, some requirements. But in any case, all of this, um, it's a combination of protocols, implementation, configuration, and at the end of the day, can we get to that uh, super low latency so, we, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe our grandchildren won't even know what a steering wheel is, would be cool. With that, any questions? Um, right next to you. I think you're hiding it, Ron. Um, so, what was the? There was a physical latency on your on your rig, right? Do you know what that is, or did you measure that when you switch off the the track for oh, the for, for the actual yeah. latency? Yeah. Um, so the way I looked at it, I think I measured out the track. It's like maybe to scale 100 feet to make a decision. And the cars are going about 100 miles per hour at scale. So these are stopping really fast. Um, the latency, 
So it's stopping at about a distance of that. Uh, you could compute the distance. Uh, it's got to be. They, 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 it's, they, got to be. it's on or off, by the way. So, it's on or off. Yeah, it's, it's binary. A uh, more advanced solution, obviously. No, 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 it's on or off. No, but I'm saying it's got to be in the same order overall, right? So, like, so what happens? So, so we see the vehicle uh, run the algorithm. So you need, you need um, obviously, two, two cameras to see the data. We detect the conflict, look it up in a table, say there's a conflict. The guy who just entered has to yield. Um, turn off the power to the H grid, that's an Arduino, that's probably minimal latency. But then the car has inertia, doesn't have brakes, so it kind of kind kind of comes to a complete stop. Um, honestly, I'm a little surprised we were able to do this with the with that variance. Uh, these cars actually stop pretty quickly since they're heavier. I have some lighter cars that actually will slide through the intersection. But it is, it is tight, like I said. Uh, the other thing I noticed is if the CP utilization is uh, too high, all bets are off. It'll, they'll just crash. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I get that. My question was sort of extrapolating that to the real world. There is going to be, in, in addition to all the things we talked about, there's going to be like some like uh, lag, delay, skid factor yep. in, in the physical thing that you're going to say stop to, right? If a car has bad tires, it doesn't stop as fast, whatever, right? So I think the, the application latency, I've heard quoted, was 40 milliseconds. Um, and even then, the, the internal signal in the vehicle may be pretty high. But we're going, we are going from like half a second, 1.5 seconds down to something less than about 100 milliseconds. When you do that, distances, margin of error does, does improve. But... There's, there's so many other factors. And then you know, the other thing is I, I also have random events, right? I have a kid running in the middle of the street. I can't control that. So there, there's no way to make this a perfectly synchronized system. Um, it, it's just a fact, you know, real life, right? It's not a closed system. I cannot account for every variable. And we've seen the spectacular ways that, that this can fail. Like autonomous vehicle hits somebody. It just continues like nothing happened. A little weird, but... It happens. So, yeah, I mean, all of those things have to take into account. That's the ecosystem. That's the application. question is, can you do better than, than humans? And that's, that's what, for instance, uh, Tesla and those guys are selling right now to the insurance companies. We can cut down on accidents. So can a system like this cut down on accidents? At the end of the day, that's really what it's about. And allowing grandma to drive into her 90s would be cool, too. But. Hi, Tom. Hi. Um, so there's work to build next generation APIs in the ITF with the, the TAPS working group. All of these considerations around low latency have been considered in the, the, the NEAT project, which is an input to that. But we do not have anybody coming from the self-driving car world or the remote operations world to give us input to help us evaluate how we're doing. Where, where do we get these people from? So when you say that, that CapEx? TAPS. TAPS, oh, okay. Um, that, that's the one that wants to extend Socket's layer or come up with a new API? Um, it is a new API. But all of the current systems that exist, so there are, there are three implementations which are all obviously on top of the Socket's API. Okay, so... Yeah, that, I'm, I'm a little familiar with that. Um, there definitely have been other proposals. Uh, it's Sockets API is, is kind of weird because it's, it's the most maligned API in the world. People have tried to replace it. A long time ago, there was TLI or something like that that was supposed to replace it. Um, it's not going away. Uh, the question is, how do you extend it um, without, without re rewriting it? So... My advice to, to taking that approach is what, what do you need to actually get what you want? Um, if you need to do a complete rewrite at the lowest layer, like in the kernel, uh, that's clearly going to be a problem in Linux. And you could go to, to uh, something like DPDK, and they'd be more than happy to do an alternative. Um, but we're kind of 
in the Linux world, it's kind of bound, right? Because we have this um, requirement to be general and to support legacy for the past, like, I guess, 50 years now or whatever. And on the other hand, we want to extend it. So I think the, the, the people who need, who would do this are in this room. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a give and take. Uh, if you come up, if somebody came up with a new API and said, please implement this, there's going to be immediate pushback. APIs are, are among the most sensitive of things you can do. We don't like to change them. But if you come and say, here's the extensions we need, that's a more interesting, interesting avenue. Yeah, and, and I guess that, so the problem we have is we have the implementations of these APIs. They, they exist. But we, we do not have the, the feedback from the communities that need these ultra low latencies to, to, to see if we're actually going to fulfill these goals. So are you worried about feedback from users or feedback from the developers who would build the APIs? I, I guess that the problem is we, we don't have the problems here because most of the people involved there are transport people. So we're used to, to network transport problems. And so we can come up with a, a synthetic issue, but we're not getting to iterate in the same way that a, a self-driving car team would. And so we, we, we're not going to get a a tight integration. We can build a general system that can do uh, signaling to a network plane or receiving signals from the network and, and incorporate it based on, on policy and we can build feedback in dynamic systems, but we're, we're, we're not going to know if we built a system that will work for uh, meshed self-driving cars without a system that is doing meshed self-driving cars. Sure. Um. I guess my comment to that is, uh, like I said before, somehow somehow you want to be generic and yet also specific. So it's a little bit of a, a challenge. My belief is there should be a lot of commonality um, between these. So, for instance, in, in the network signaling, uh, it seems to me that could be one one method. And the network is offering different services. So. One network may be offering um, uh, video chat service, definitely would be something compelling. That has a, late, a latency requirement that streaming video doesn't. But that certainly doesn't have the same latency requirements that the self-driving car, car has. But my question is, can they all be um, kind of instantiated with the same API layer? So the application says, here are my requirements, network, please provide them. So. I, I, this is, I, I know, I think I know where you're coming from, that there's often um, inclination to create specific API, specific protocols for specific applications. And I think that that has some merit. But on the flip side, I look at, like, the history of, of say, TCP um, and how flexible that's been, even for, even for something like this. I mean, at one point, people were saying TCP was going to go away because it couldn't scale. And then uh, Van Jacobson, I guess our keynote speaker, he comes along, he fixes it. So, and then it goes on. Now we're coming again, people saying TCP is, is failing again. So I think history shows that there's a lot of adaptability. Um, I think this is not, it's, some of this in a sense is revolutionary, but there's a lot of evolution happening. So I, I think it's not black and white, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying. So um, you may need a new API, you may need new protocols. But we still don't want to throw out everything we've learned in history, right? So uh, it, it's work. And the nice thing about Linux community, um, if you do bring an implementation in, it, it will, be, will be properly evaluated. And we, we, you know, we, we love to see that. So if there is a new API, it'll get a, a, fair, a fair play. But there's also that scrutiny. You know, why, why do you need to replace, say, the socket connect call with a super connect? Why can't you just set socket options and then do connect? So there's always going to be that sort of give and take. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> were, you, were you saying that was the end? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, you stated as a limitation that people could uh, deface traffic signs uh, and get the autonomous cars to keep driving when there should be a stop. But in my opinion, that's a problem that already exists. Uh, to, today, uh, you go to, you remove 
some staff signs and you put the, you have the priority design and you just kill people. And the reason why it doesn't happen so much is that most people are not murderers in the first place. Um, and it's kind of a more of a metaphysical question about object recognition. So let me give you an example of an interesting scenario. So you're driving down the street and you see something in the road. I won't say what something is yet. What do you do? Slow down. Well, it's, it's in front of you. So you, you're either going to hit it or you're going to have to go to a different lane. Without any more context, you can't make that decision. What if you saw this thing had a previous behavior? Say it was floating around in the sky because it was a bag, and then it landed. So now you see this, and you, you detected that as, as a bag. Now, if you're the self-driving car, what if it, all it sees is an object in the road? I can't identify it, so I'm going to swerve, even though you could have just ran over it. There was actually one of the, I think the initial, uh, the first crash Google ever had in their autonomous vehicle I think a, um, the car changed lanes because of a, a sandbag or something that it could have run, ran over in theory. It's, it's part, it's, it's object recognition. Um, the networking component of that obviously is just the kind of the back end. But in order to, to do this, you actually need uh, a, a huge amount of logic. And that's, that's the reason why self-driving cars really are a hard problem. It's a very open, open scenario. Um, so when I presented a couple of times ago in NetDev, I pointed out that your average 15-year-old learning how to drive still has more intelligence than all the computers in the world and the ability to be able to, to sense things. Because they have 15 years of real-world experience that you can apply to this completely different application. So I guess it goes back to the API question. So the API and your average 15-year-old learning to drive, um, it's a poor API, but at least it's... it's uh, malleable and they have all that experience they apply apply to it. Yes, but on the other hand, each 15-year-old that's learning to drive has his own experience. And uh, if you, I don't know, if you learn to drive in the countryside and then you move to New York, then it's useless. Uh, when, if you go with machine learning, you can grab all the experience from all the cars everywhere in every possible situation and get something more, a lot more global. Yeah, I think, uh, I think let's get in, into the uh, self-driving car. That might be interesting next time. Uh, next NetDev to have somebody come in. Uh, it's obviously a huge, huge problem. A lot of AI, a lot of machine learning, um, and just an endless amount of variables. How do you tell the difference between a mailbox and a human? Uh, things that are obvious. Um, so, I mean, it's uh, think of it as an open, open issue. Um, you know, to quote, I don't know who said, I guess it was maybe Zuckerberg, what we estimate we can do in two years, people usually overestimate, but what you estimate you can do in 10 years, people used to underestimate. So 100 years from now, all this has solved problems. And, you know, that they, they just fixed. How to get there is the interesting path. So right now, you're seeing a lot of, of growing pains. Um, and the, the interesting thing about the self-driving cars, every time there's an accident, it's just going to make front, front page news. So, and... Whatever we can do to, to improve that scenario, I think that um, I think we, Linux uh, and NetDev are definitely a part of that, especially for the communications piece. But a lot of has to happen on the whole ecosystem to make it work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.